Hello, everyone. Welcome to our AP Bio Review. My name is Ari. Joined with me is our wonderful off-camera instructor, Nick. And we're excited to see you. And Beryl, I see your question. I am going to mention the new AP format um, just very briefly. And as you correctly discerned, we are not going to be covering the last two units, which is ecology and natural selection. So, um, you know, I'm glad that you guys are all um, keeping your eye closely on, on the new changes that have only really just been released hours ago. Um, so, uh, so, so awesome job. Yeah, no, so, <clears throat> So let's let, let's head into this. Not only is the topics that we're going to cover today um, particularly relevant, <laughs> um, they are they are quite high yield, and uh, I'm excited to go through some questions with you. And so remember, <clears throat> if you were here last time, uh, the focus of our review isn't so much to be teaching you content, but be, to be reviewing content through the concept, con context of some questions. Um, so, so that's that's what we're going to do. I'm not going to sit here and just blabber at you. I'd love for you to interact with us in the chat. <clears throat> so feel free to um, chime in with your responses, ask your questions. We have um, both myself and Nick here to um, you know address really anything that you have on your mind. Um, so please, please do interact with us. So I'm going to get started with. There we go. Okay, so throw me a yes or purple or something. When you see the, the big old um, thing on my screen, it's very purple and blue. It says AP biology cells, bacteria, and the always relevant viruses. So once once I see some responses, let's get we'll get we'll get started. So yeah, so what I don't know, cells, bacteria, viruses think about that stuff it's uh it's very very important you know it's the stuff that makes up all of us makes up a lot of the things that are around us has direct relevance to us um excellent molly well done okay so let's let's get going um so here's here's i stole this directly from david <laughs> i i will admit um we've got <coughs> some of the big old breaking news that was released just this morning um, the AP has been shortened and it is going to be at home. There are, uh, it's going to be uh, not testing the last two units. The last about 20% for bio, it is natural selection and ecology will not be found on the test because those are usually covered later in the year. Um, there'll be two different test dates for every AP test for two students to choose from. It will be taken at home and you will not be limited by technology. So if you don't have the ability to submit stuff on a, um, you know, on, on a, a computer or a laptop, you can do it on paper. You could take a picture of it and submit it and that would be good enough for the AP exams. Efforts will be made to prevent cheating. We recognize that, you know, this is kind of hard when you're doing, when you're doing uh, exams at home. There are some, some free live reviews that are starting, uh, offered by the College Award that's gonna be starting, um, I believe next week. I did take a peek at the bio ones. Um, and interestingly, and I'm not sure what, what's going on and whether they will change this or update it, the reviews are covering parts of biology that is not on the test. <laughs> so um, hopefully they'll be adding in some more ones there. So Molly, at this point, um, if even if the schools do reopen, I'm I'm pretty doubtful if they've made an official announcement that it's going to be at home. It's probably going to stick with being at home, even if the schools do reopen, just because they can't account for all the different places that have um, different uh, you know restrictions on when people are coming back to school. And yeah, Nicole, the entire exam is shortened to 45 minutes, just 45 minutes. Um, the details of the exact dates, the software, the question types, all of that stuff is going to be released April 3rd. So put that on your calendar. Um, College Board will release more details about what exactly is going on uh, with that 45 minutes that you're going to be taking. And yes, Molly, um, I, I saw a very, very recently released tweet from um, the vice president of the, the guy who heads the college boards, the AP exams, and he did say, he did confirm that this was a free response only, so no multiple choice questions. Now, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I prepped for a bunch of multiple choice questions today. I did sneak in one free response at the very last minute. Nick was like, I don't know about that area, <laughs> but we will do our best to do that. And um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be only free response. At this point, the information we know, it's going to be only free response. We don't know how many, 
of these. And so Alicia, we are going to be doing, um, at this point in time, uh, we are going to be doing uh, these style of like one hour review sessions covering units. Um, so today is the last one for this week and we're gonna run them five times next week. So Monday through Friday next week, we're gonna cover all the units, sampling from all the units. Um, and if there are more, we'll keep you posted. Uh, we would love to do more of these. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling that there's, it's a good possibility that there might be more. So please do invite all your friends and family to come and hang out with us. Um, and that will give us more incentive to offer more of these. And Bella, yeah, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be, it's gonna be like, probably shorter a couple of short free responses but beyond that I'm not I'm not 100% sure um and that's going to be probably generally for all the tests but beyond that they'll release more specifics it's, it's kind of hard to speculate <laughs> I don't want to give you guys wrong information um and so as of this time the what I do know is that it doesn't look like there's going to be any multiple choice questions yeah yeah, Anthony, I, I totally fearfully feel for you. Um, this is a lot of work that uh, is likely going to be very different from what you intended um, with your prep. So, yeah, I mean, we, we roll with the punches, right? Uh, a big part of, of studying for these big kind of like college credit kind of courses is you know, it's it, the, the science should stay the same. Like what you're studying isn't a waste of time. You just have to kind of shift your focus so that your practice um, leading up to test day is going to be a little bit more um, related to what you're actually going to end up doing. So while multiple choice questions um, is, is, is a little bit, sometimes a little bit more straightforward, there's a lot more strategy behind like how you can um, go through process of elimination and do some types, types of predictions and stuff like that. The science behind that is still the same, whether it is testing, free response or multiple choices. Um, so that's what we're gonna focus on today. We're still gonna do a couple of multiple choices. I did pull one free response question to do together, um, but hopefully the science that we do cover, regardless of what format it's going to be, is gonna be relevant and interesting uh, for you and you're gonna have a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, Nicole, I'll, other than that, I believe the grading will be the same, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so keep posted. Yeah, we don't know how many free responses, though, Alicia. I doubt it'll be six. In 45 minutes, I, I very much doubt it'll be six of those. It'll probably be a reduced number as well. Okay. 45 minutes, 45 minutes. Okay, so let's get going with our very first question. Um, the In this lesson, we're going to be tackling questions on prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. We're going to talk about the organelles, the little compartments that exist within eukaryotes, right? Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about genetic transfer. That's going to be the topic of our free response questions. And we're going to do one question on viruses. Now, I did purposely choose a virus question, mostly because it's very relevant. It's not super high yield for the AP bio test, um, but it is it is very possible. And, you know, I feel like with the changing times, it'd be um, kind of an interesting and relevant thing to throw in a virus question, okay? So if you were here with me yesterday, you'll see the drill. I'm just gonna pop up question on screen. These are all pulled from the AP Bio Prep book, mostly. And, and I will uh, give you a minute to work through the question, grab some paper. Um, and, and if you need to take any notes and write down your answer, please go ahead and do that. And um, yeah, let's get started. So here is your very first question. Notice it's kind of long, there is a graph. So pay careful attention to your analysis of the graph. Make sure it is used to support the correct answer. I'm gonna give you one minute to do this question on your own. When we come back, we will review it together.
Okay, come on back, everyone. We have scientists looking at mitochondria and several sets of human tissue. They look at the content of mitochondria by measuring the activity of a certain kind of enzyme that only exists in mitochondria. We've got our graph below, and then we're looking for the hypothesis that would strongly most justify the observation. Now, I take exception to language like this. What is, what, if you see things like best supports or most justified, Sometimes you might be tempted to think, hmm, well, I bet that there are some answers that are kind of justifying or some answers that are partially correct. Don't do that. On a test, there's no such thing as I have to make decisions as to which one is a better answer, which one's a worse answer. There's only one right and there's going to be three wrong. Now, I know, I know, <laughs> I know for fear response questions that not necessarily true, but I think the thought process is still the same. Don't get trapped into trying to use an answer choice that is not supported by the data. Only one of these is gonna be supported by the data. Before you look at the answer, so you take a look at the graph. And so your big takeaway, and we talked about this yesterday when we we're analyzing graphs, um, what is your big takeaway? So you can see on the bottom, on the y-axis, you have those different kinds of muscles, uh, uh, different kinds of tissue. You got muscle, heart, liver, kidney, brain. And then on the y-axis, you have how much mitochondria exists. So tell me your big takeaway. What, is, what kind of like pops out at you um, based on your initial glance through at what is being assessed, what is being measured, and what does the trend in the data tell you? Ria, it will stay um, on, on YouTube for a bit, yeah. Why don't you tell me in the public chat, what is your big takeaway, your big trend? And I want you to make sure to do this in your own practice. When you're given data, you look at it, you figure out what does this data tell me first, and then you look at the answer choices. If you do it backwards, a lot of these things are gonna be very, very tempting. <clears throat> so I'll be quiet, go ahead and tell me, what do you think? So if you're thinking, if you're thinking, well, liver, kidney, brain, doesn't seem to have a lot of mitochondria because these are kind of low, right? Yeah, Nicole, exactly. And then muscle and heart have a lot of mitochondria. <clears throat> and if you're thinking a little bit deeper as to like, why? Well, that's what the answer choices are going to tell you, right? Um, so that's it. I would say liver, kidney, brain, not a lot of mitochondria, muscle and heart has a lot. So we're looking for something that's gonna support the reason why the muscle and the heart would require more mitochondria. <clears throat> pretty much, pretty much, Nicole, yeah. And so a good part of being a scientist is being uh, careful about the way you pull the, the information from the data to provide um, well-supported conclusions. Okay, so you guys are thinking like scientists. So A says a heart muscle uses a large supply of ATP because it contracts and relaxes continuously. So first of all, assess that, that, that statement. Is this a true scientific fact? Does the muscle need a lot of ATP in the form? And so that's energy, right? Because it contracts and relaxes continuously. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? Now, does that link with the data? What is the link between mitochondria and ATP? Hmm, well, you know, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. It is the one organelle in your body that produces the most amount of ATP. So does it make sense that the heart has a lot of mitochondria because it requires a lot of ATP because it, it needs to contract continuously? Yeah, yeah, so that is your correct answer. A is absolutely correct, okay? Now, who here was like, I don't trust myself. I can see that A is correct, but I'm gonna keep looking at the other answer choices. The more and more practice you do, the more and more you will be able to trust yourself. And on a free response question, clearly what you come up with has to be correct. You're not gonna to have to like, you know, waste time analyzing a bunch of wrong answers. So Beryl, exactly, I want you to kind of stick with that one big key idea that the mitochondria is going to require or produce that ATP. So real quick, the reason why the wrong answers are wrong, skeletal muscles need a large amount of mitochondria. Yeah, that, that's good. To support protein synthesis. Hmm, <laughs> sounds so tempting, so tempting. But what organelle, what organelle must we be thinking of when we've got protein synthesis? 
What do you think? And we'll talk about C as well, Molly. We'll talk about C as well. What organelle is required for protein synthesis? Yeah, let's talk about that, Bella. Why isn't it B? The first part of the answer choice is supported by the data. But the last part of the answer choice is the part that I have exception with. Because it's not, it's not the mitochondria that supports protein synthesis. This is stuff like ribosomes, right? Which is in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Alicia, exactly, rough ER. So, so this, is, this is a really key thing about answer choices that are very tempting. Sometimes it looks partially right, but it's not all right. And for an answer choice to be right, the entire thing must be right. If a part of it is wrong, the entire thing is trash. So B is wrong because of that reason. Let's look at C. <clears throat> the liver does not need mitochondria to function. Okay, well, hmm. I mean, the liver is the lowest amount of mitochondria according to our graph, but is it zero? Is there like no right mitochondria at all? No, there's still a tiny, tiny amount in there. Right, and, and our data does not give us information about whether it's required for function. We don't have that information. So while it's tempting to pull it out from C because it's the lowest number or the lowest value on our graph, it's not something you can discern from this graph alone. So you gotta be careful about the kind of conclusions you draw from data. Sometimes they just take it too far. C is not supported. We still have a little bit of mitochondria and liver according to our graph. And then D is opposite to what we're looking for. The relative amounts of mitochondria in each tissue does definitely have physiological significance. The more energy you require like muscles and heart is a type of muscle, <coughs> the more mitochondria you will necessarily have. So A is the correct answer. So Nicole, you wanna, and, and this is a mi multiple choice kind of specific um, issue, I will say. Um, so maybe not, not necessarily like super important for the AP test, but just in general for future multiple choice questions, if you think about an answer ahead of time and you see exactly what that answer is, don't immediately pick it, but carefully analyze the entire answer choice to make sure it fully matches both what the question is asking as well as being a scientific fact. And if you're good with that, that all, all checks out, I want you to have the confidence to pick it and move on. So here at Kaplan, we call it the pick it and quit it. <laughs> The pick it and quit it. And uh, the more practice you do, the better and better you'll be able to have that self-confidence to do just that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's do, let's do another one. So, <laughs> this is the one, this is the one I was so excited to show you guys. Okay. So we're going to take another minute to do this question. Like yesterday, remember, we talked about patterns in the answer choices. There's some pretty good patterns going on in this question. Let's take one minute to do this question on your own. Okay, team. So um, Bella's asking what unit was virus covered in? Technically virus is, is very briefly mentioned in unit three. So I don't want you to stress over, um, over this if you haven't had a chance to do this. The only reason why I'm doing a virus question right now is because it's very relevant. Um, it, it is not as likely to show up on the AP bio exam compared to like all the other parts of bio that you need to know. So, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Um, certain viruses like COVID-19 have higher mutation rates than other viruses, such as a virus that causes chicken pox. Which statement best explains this difference? 
So if you look at the patterns, um, it talks about COVID-19 being either DNA or an RNA virus. And then the chip, chickenpox has either DNA, RNA, or retrovirus. So these are all, all terms you should know. Um, you know, what's a virus? What is the difference between these three different kinds of viruses? Um, so yeah, it's not a unit, Ria. Um, and, and I agree with, uh, with, with, with what you're saying, but it is briefly covered in, the, in unit three of, of like cell bio, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's talk about um, these components. So DNA virus means that the virus itself, okay, so actually maybe let's back up a bit. You guys all know what viruses are. What's the difference between a virus and us as like cells or bacteria or prokaryotes? What is a one big distinction about viruses um, that if you don't know anything about viruses, this is the one thing I would like you to take away from. What's, what's so interesting and fascinating about viruses? I love, I love the, the, the biology behind viruses. They're so cool. <laughs> oh, Oh, let's let's talk about that. So it's not quite a retrovirus, but it's a retrovirus is a subtype of a type of virus, Beryl. Viruses do need something in order to reproduce. By definition, and this is how like biologists classically will define a living thing, living things are able to reproduce by themselves. Since viruses require a host to reproduce, we don't classify viruses as living. They're just like these things that go and like force the host to reproduce and replicate itself. And then you've got a, tiny, a, a bunch of other tiny viruses. Yeah, so um, in terms of the viruses though, we've got a bunch of different subtypes because really they're just like, like you know, containers with genetic information. And the genetic information is what's required in order for it, like that's what coding for other parts, like parts of, of the virus that is required to reassemble and to make more, more viruses. Here is exactly, viruses are non-living, but they kind of do have living characteristics. They move around. They are able to like, you know, venture into other hosts and stuff like that. So let's think about this. <clears throat> What's so different about certain kinds of viruses? Another very common virus that had this higher mutation rate was Ebola. And you guys all, I don't know if you guys, <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember the Ebola outbreaks from a while back, but they were also a very scary kind of time in, in, in history, not like far, far history, but a couple of years back. Um, yeah, so, so the, what is inside the virus um, definitely does dictate a lot of, um, the way that viruses um, change and adapt to the situations. So if you have a higher mutation rate, it's very possible that you know you, the way you mutate, the way the virus mutates is unfavorable. Like selection pressure will favor against it and it'll die out. But the ability to randomly mutate very, very frequently gives you a higher likelihood of having something advantageous. That's how, you know, that's how evolution works in general. So having higher mutation rates is favorable for very different kind of changing conditions. So how does that work based on the kind of genetic information you have? Well, central dogma of genetics says that we, as eukaryotes have DNA, we translate that into RNA and that becomes protein. This is central dogma of genetics. In viruses, they don't always just have DNA. Alicia, yeah, that's a great point. Some of them, some of them are RNA based. Now, the big thing about DNA and then replication of DNA is that they have something called DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is actually a super cool, very um, you know, important enzyme that does a lot of jobs. It doesn't just replicate DNA, it has a lot of proofreading ability. So if, if I told you, you know, you know go, go talk to my uncle, he's a really good proofreader, he's gonna <clears throat> read through your text, your essay, and he's gonna like pick out all the mistakes and fix them, that's a proofreader. DNA polymerase has a lot of proofreading abilities as well. So, you know, under the process of like remaking or replicating DNA, it also works backwards and fixes things that it's made mistake of. But if you have an RNA-based enzyme, an RNA-based enzyme, and it's directly, it's, it's called positive sense RNA, it's directly translated into protein. Well, when you have an RNA polymerase, it doesn't really have that proofreading ability. And so it, it's very prone to making a lot of mistakes. Sometimes, most of the times, those mistakes are bad and that virus won't survive. 
but on occasion, that mistake is very favorable. And so that's what's leading to the higher mutation rate. So the reason why the correct answer here is B is because COVID-19, like Ebola, is an RNA virus. DNA virus is like chickenpox. It's very stable, doesn't change. Once you're um, vaccinated against chickenpox, it tends to be that you don't ever get it again because chickenpox virus is the exact same all the time because it's a DNA-based virus, okay? Um, retrovirus is another type of an RNA virus. So that's why that's why like C and D are wrong. Um, so chickenpox is not a retrovirus. What are retroviruses? And this is another really cool thing. Um, retrovirus is essentially, what does retro mean? Like retroactive, you know, retro something. It means to go backwards, right? So retroviruses essentially go backwards. They have something called um, a retro, uh, like a, a type of retro polymerase. And then it re it goes backwards in the in the kind of the central dogma process is it makes DNA and that DNA isn't just like oh just make more of my 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 virus it inserts it into the host and so it goes sometimes it goes dormant if you've ever heard of things like um, the herpes virus like the little cold sore virus sometimes like it's like not there other times it kind of like breaks out um, when it's not there it's because it's not actively replicating uh, little viral things. Reverse transcriptase viral, you are on it. Well done. Yeah, they have um, a type of enzyme called a reverse transcriptase that goes from RNA to DNA, and that DNA then inserts into the host genome. So nice, cool, right? Science is cool and relevant. Um, so I hope you learned not just a little bit about um, you know the stuff for AP Bio, but you learned a little bit about why COVID nineteen um, did have that high rate of mutation where it was initially an animal virus, but because it's an RNA-based virus, if this is true of really any RNA-based virus, they're a little bit scarier because they have that higher mutation rate. Okay, so let's take another look at a different kind of question. We're going to kind of shift over to some bacteria stuff. So just like last time, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you one minute to do this question on your own. Go ahead and throw in your answers into the chat. Don't be afraid. If you have a different answer, be brave. Put that in the chat too. So we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to answer all your questions. So one minute here. Okay, go ahead and tell me what you think would be the answer to this next question. We have a pharmaceutical company evaluating some drugs to treat bacterial infection. And this is a key point. We're talking about a specific kind of infection here, just bacterial. We have a couple of different candidates using different mechanisms of action. Which one would be the most safe for humans? Whoa, Rigeu, if you are not taking AP Bio, you are um, well set up if you are interested in taking AP Bio in the future or doing that. Ah, I like what you guys are possibly saying. So Lishak, Shara, Farhan um, are saying C. So we'll talk about B and C specifically because, um, you know, we don't have a consensus and that's okay. We don't have to. Um, really, the heart of this question is asking, like, if you want it to be safe for humans, right? If you want it to be safe for humans, then you don't want it to have something that is common with humans. Okay, so what is different between uh, bacteria and humans? 
I mean, many, many different things. Obviously, we are multicellular, but at the cellular level, team, what do you think? What is the difference between bacteria and human at the cellular level? There's really one key component. Um, no, there's a couple of key components I want you to fix in on. Let's think. Well, bacteria are a type of prokaryote, right? Prokaryotes have um, a lot of a, a lot of the same kind of cellular machinery, but the way that they're inside of their cells are arranged is very different if you're a eukaryote. Eukaryotes have something called um, organelles, right? So they have membrane bound organelles. They've got like things like mitochondria. They've got, um, you know, a cell membrane around the nucleus. They've got Golgi, they got ER, things like that. And while a lot of those processes still happen in the prokaryotic system, they just don't have them all neatly divided by with cellular membrane. Yeah, Molly, yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of a key component. So that's one big thing. The second one has to do with what is covering the outside. You guys all know, um, you know, gram positive, gram negative, those kinds of stains. If you've done any of those labs in your orgo, sometimes the cell when you stain them are pink, some of them are purple. That has to do with one key component um, that exists on the outside of bacterial um, cells that we don't have as eukaryotes, we don't have. And so as Molly and um, let me let me see who was it that said it a little bit earlier. Um, Rigeu said it has to do with the cell wall. The correct answer here is actually B, a molecule that inhibits the cross-linking of subunits in the biosynthesis of cell walls is the key component where this would tar target bacteria, but it would not really affect humans because humans don't have cell walls. What do eukaryotes have instead? What do we term as a thing that envelops the outside of our cells? It's not cell walls. Cell walls have things like peptidoglycan um, and we don't make peptidoglycans. Our outside covering is generally lipid based and we call that not cell walls, but what do we call that? Yeah, now we know. And really, if you're doing questions and you're expecting yourself to get them right, you're not learning. <laughs> so we're doing hard questions for a reason, is that I want this to be an opportunity for you to dig into what you do know and what you don't know. And I expect answer choices to be wrong, and that's okay, because that way you know exactly what to fix for for next time. Okay, so to answer my question a little bit earlier, the thing that we have as eukaryotes on the outside is called a cell membrane. So a cell membrane, if you've ever seen like diagrams, they've got these like, you know, these kind of things, right? Yeah, phospholipid, bilayer, blah, 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 things like that, right? So this is what we have on the outside. While um, bacteria also have phospholipid bilayers, they also have an additional component on the outside of that called the cell wall. And so that can be a thin one or a thick one. That's, that's the reason why you get different kinds of staining, gram staining um, for bacteria. Uh, yeah, yeah, good, okay. Um, real quick, um, A, C, and D are all things that is true of um, eukaryotes. And that's why C is wrong. Golgi apparatus is something that only exists in eukaryotes. So that's actually be kind of bad. That would specifically target eukaryotic cells, human cells. Um, and a molecule that inhibits the biosynthesis of phospholipids in the plasma membrane would also target both. Okay, so Molly, would these questions be considered harder questions on the test? I did purposely pick harder questions for a reason. Um, you know, questions that just test recall of knowledge aren't um, as interesting, honestly, to cover in a, in a, in a review session. And then secondly, <coughs> you're just more likely to know them if you don't. It's like if you just, you know them or you don't. Um, and so I did choose questions that were a bit on the harder level, um, just so that we can foster a bit more conversation. You get a chance to review a little bit more. Great question, Kaylin. Yeah, what does it mean by cross-linking of subunits? Now, I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember the exact way that peptidoglycans link together. What I'm assuming is that like peptidoglycans got a lot of like, <coughs> um, a certain kind of, of cell molecule. And so let's say like, <laughs> I, I, I don't quite remember the, the intricacies of what's behind the peptidoglycan, but what cross-linking means is a covalent bond that exists between like certain kind of individual subunits. So that's what this means. If I am, if I'm like cutting off, I cannot make these cross-linking, these covalent bonds that exist between these subunits that I can't build my cell wall. That's really what that means. 
Um, so if it prevents modifications of proteins, that's not safe for humans at all, Alicia. We need those proteins too. A molecule that prevents modifications of proteins would be very bad for humans because we are um, a large part of protein, like our muscles, our, our, our skin, the hair, those are all like um, things that are <coughs> protein-based, okay? Yeah, so it's a tricky question. I will I completely admit it is a very tricky question. A is also wrong to be clear if anyone did pick A because uh, bacteria don't have nuclear membranes. They have nucleoli, like areas that like where the genetic information kind of sit, but they don't actually have a membrane. So A is wrong for that reason. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. Um, one second, get this, okay. So what I think would be helpful for us to do is kind of walk through a free response question. Okay, we're gonna walk through a free response question. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to kind of like talk through the question. The, the actual, you know, information as to like what you should be writing down for questions like this one isn't something that I'm gonna type on screen, but we will we'll kind of like walk through them together. So um, what I would like for you to do is, um, this is it. Okay, so I'm going to give you, mm, we'll say like a minute and a half. Okay, a minute and a half. Don't worry about the questions on the side. What I want you to do is just take a look at the stimulus. So it's a short paragraph and a little uh, diagram. Take about a minute and a half and then think about what you do know about it. Um, and if you want to, you can kind of, you know, head on over and, and look at the first question that's on the side, but we'll kind of talk through the question together instead. Okay, so one and a half minutes to take a look at this, the stimulus on the left on your own. If you have time, in addition, you can take a look at some of the questions too as well. So uh, let me just grab my timer, not 10 minutes. There we go. Okay, so one and a half minutes just to look at the stimulus. Okay, come on back. Let's uh, let's kind of talk through the information we're getting from our stimulus. We've got our diagram. So scientists is is conducting experiment with some penicillin sensitive bacteria in which we add a plasmid containing a gene that confers penicillin resistance. We're going to follow a protocol that has growth uptake of that plasma DNA, and then he plates it. Plates it means you know, this is, um, you know, it's, it's that little petri dish. It's got some agar, some growth medium in there. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and then we're going to throw in our bacteria and then we're going to kind of like let it sit at a good temperature. And then we're going to wait and see if there's any growth on those plates, little like little circles that indicate bacterial growth. So you got four different plates, um, four different kinds of conditions. Here we have uh, no plasmid. Sorry, I'm just going to grab my pen. doesn't want to give me a different color. I don't want to do red. Okay, so we've got no plasmid, no antibody, right? No plasmid with antibody, uh, antibiotic, sorry. 
plasmid without antibiotic, plasmid with antibiotic. Um, and so the first part of this is um, talking about plasmids. So um, in, in the context of discussing this, we're actually gonna probably answer a couple of these problems. Um, and then we'll talk about like, how do you, how do you wanna like arrange that on a free response question? But go ahead and tell me, what do you know about plasmids? What are, what are so like, why do we term plasmids as something that is actually pretty different from chromosomes? Hmm, plasmids, what are plasmids? Um, I think we made some like very brief mention of them possibly in some of the earlier questions. If we didn't, we just, I skipped them. <laughs> um, but plasmids are something that we as eukaryotes don't, um, don't use because what the way plasmids work are, are quite different from the way our genetic information is rearranged. So plasmids, let's talk about that. So plasmids are little circles, right? They're little circles, usually single-stranded little circles, and they um, have a bunch of genetic information, but the key distinction between like a chromosome and a plasmid, plasmid <clears throat> is that they are circular and they're usually quite small, smaller than like the usual kind of genetic information. So like sure, exactly, small circular DNA. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, and so uh, not only do they replicate separately from chromosomes, they just, um, you know, they're, they're usually the genetic information in bacteria is circular as well. So we wouldn't call that the chromosome, I guess, of because chromosomes are linear by, by definition. But yeah, so plasmids do contain genetic information and they do reproduce um, uh, not differently, but they are kind of sep like they, they, there's like, you know, there's a host like the, the, the usual cellular genetic information. And then there's like another additional kind of circle there. And that's what we would usually call it as a plasmid. Um, so what, is, what does that mean? So how do they evolve in genetic information? So usually what you can do is just introduce a plasmid to a bacteria. Um, and then they provide bacteria with like things like cool additional things like, I don't know, uh, antibiotic resistance, <laughs> like a, a gene that will um, allow a bacteria to survive the presence of a certain kind of bacteria, uh, uh, antibiotic. They might confer advantages to survival. They might make you grow better. They might you know, make it more favorable for reproduction. So it's just, it's genetic information, but what's on there though, is gonna be um, you know, in, important um, depending on the kind of conditions that they're, that's in. So for, for A, so it says describe plasmids and their involvement. What you want to have is circular, small circular pieces of DNA. Um, they replicate independently. You want to also describe how they have genetic um, advantages, like um, surviving in the presence of antibiotics for reproduction and for, for growth as well. Okay. So that's, that's the A part of this. B says predict what will happen on the plates. So let's walk through these one by one. So if you have lots of like good stuff in the medium, so glucose with no antibiotic and bacterial plus strain without any plasmid, why don't you go ahead and tell me, what would you predict to happen on my plate? So no antibiotic, right? And no plasmid. So this would be just the, the native cell all by itself. Native meaning like nothing has been done to it. We call that wild type as well. This is just the cell all on its own. No, you know, no thing to like, no antibiotic to make it go away, but it doesn't have that cool additional plasmid. So if you're thinking this guy, this guy should give me some growth and you are absolutely correct. I, you should expect to see growth in, um, you know, in, in glucose medium without any antibiotic without any additional plasmid there. Okay, so let's see if your prediction's right, Nicole. Let's look at plate two. Plate two says, I have penicillin, but I do not have any plasmid. So remember, we told in the passage, in the stimulus, that the plasmid has that special gene that confers resistance. So meaning it will survive in the presence of our antibiotic. So if I have a bacteria that has no plasmid and I have pen penicillin around, here, I should expect to see no growth. That means that's a no, <laughs> no growth here, <coughs> no growth. Okay, so um, if we look at three, throw in your, your predictions here, right? This is that active component of learning I, I mentioned earlier. Yeah, exactly, no growth in two. 
Um, for plate three, we have um, glucose, no antibiotic with the plasmid. Having the plasmid around doesn't give you anything extra if, um, if there's no selection for it. So with no antibiotic, you should expect to see nothing different. The plasmid isn't gonna do anything bad. It's only gonna be good. So you shouldn't expect to see anything different over here. You should expect to see growth in three. So last bit, last bit, plate four, we have glucose medium with penicillin. And in plate four, we also have that plasmid added. So this is like the big kicker, the big difference between these two. Go ahead and give me your prediction for plate four. If I have plasmid around and that plasmid has that special gene, and then I add in penicillin into the medium, what should you expect to see in plate four? <coughs> so, as Nicole had correctly predicted a little bit earlier, um, the only plate that should have no growth is plate two. Plate four will also see growth because I have that cool, like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's so like a little part of the gene. It's got that, um, <laughs> I'm gonna draw like a shield. I'm such a bad drawer, you guys. <laughs> this is a shield to antibody. And oh, maybe we'll call it penicillin. I, I suppose we should call it penicillin. There we go. I should not freehand draw. <laughs> this is like a shield, okay? And then this is like penicillin, go away, X out. Okay, yeah, so I should, yeah, I have that resistance to it. Well done team, well done. I will see growth in four. Um, and, and it's all because of that cool little penicillin, uh, that plasmid. Okay, so that's our prediction for the growth patterns. And that would be um, the correct answer to be predicting the growth patterns. So see, we kind of already did it, honestly. All you gotta do is walk through each one of these plates. Plate one will have growth because there is no antibiotic in the medium. Plate two will not have growth because there is antibiotic and there's no plasmid to confer resistance. Plate three will have growth because there is no antibiotic, even though the presence of the plasma is there. And then exactly Molly, plate four will have growth because penicillin is there, but the plasma will confer resistance. That is justifying your prediction. So make one sentence for every one of those um, and, and show exactly why the prediction is supported by using that science terms, and then you're good to go. The last part is the one that isn't really related to this. I mean, it kind of is. It talks about how they have a protocol that initiates the uptake of plasmid. So there's a couple of different answers that would all be supported by answer choice D. So the protocol that scientists use to encourage the uptake. Now, let's say you haven't covered this and you're like, <coughs> I have no idea what, what any of that is. Well, you know, one way, one way is to essentially just poke holes. Right, if you, if you poke holes into this guy and all you're trying to do is like, you want your cool little plasmid to go into the cell, right? One way is to just poke some holes. A, a way to poke some holes is something called calcium chloride treatment, calcium chloride. So calcium chloride um, is a chemical way of inducing um, transformation. Transformation is the term we use to say that we want our bacteria to uptake some plasmid from the environment. So calcium chloride treatment, um, so that would be one method. So this is like chemical, okay. Um, a second way would be to essentially heat it for a really short period of time and make it nice and hot. So it's called a heat shock. So that's another way to do this. Um, a third way you can consider is uh, sonication. So sonication is just a fancy term of, um, you know, is, is, is like shaking, it looks like it's essentially just shaking it, but all that is doing is just like making, making the, pla the, the membrane a little bit unstable, allowing for the, the movement of plasmid going into the cell. Um, sonication is often used to clean jewelry, like if you've ever had your ring clean, that's sonication as well. Okay, so Flora, <coughs> good question. How would a question like this be worded um, on the new AP exam? I mean, honest, we don't know. We only got word of the, the, the actual changes for this test, um, but I feel like this would be a fair kind of, I mean, maybe maybe not as many parts if this was a short answer kind of question, but this would still be, I feel, I feel like this would be kind of in, pretty in scope of um, a free response question on the test. Um, and so Nicole, what do they look like for the processes? This is what I mean. 
These are all processes for transformation, which is essentially what this question is asking about with the protocols that is um, being, uh, being followed for the uptake of the plasma DNA. That's what that means. <coughs> and Beryl, is this like recombinant DNA? A lot of these um, protocols are used to uh, do recombination, right? So when we are, um, you know, how they make insulin these days, uh, they use little bacteria and they introduce the plasmid that has the insulin gene on it and they put it in bacteria and they're like little uh, protein factories. They overproduce that, that protein, they purify the insulin out. And so that is a type of recombin recomb recombination just means like mix and match. We're taking a human gene, putting it into a bacterial um, so that for the purpose of, of making lots and lots of that protein. So exactly correct. That is a lot of the processes using a recombination. Um, electroporation, oh, that's another one. I didn't even think of that one. Nicole, awesome job. Yeah, electroporation, I'm impressed. Yeah, it's a, it's a little like electric shock. Also does the same thing. It makes little holes, allows for the movement of plasma to go inside the cells. Remember, there's no nuclear membrane, Nicole. Um, so this would be the, the outside membrane of the bacteria, but yeah, same deal, same deal. Um, you would not have to draw a diagram for this one. All you would need is uh, like a, you know, a short paragraph for each one of these stimuluses. Nice, well done. Okay, so you know we've done this. We've we've gone through a free response question. I do want to kind of end this with one last question. Um, so let's see if I can get it here. Last question. We're gonna do one minute, one minute to work through question um, on screen on your own. I'm gonna tell you something kind of cool about this question when we're all done. So one minute for this last question together. Hey, okay, so this last question, we're looking for a statement that correctly characterizes the difference between smooth ER and rough ER. Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, this is this is not, not too bad. You, again, look at the patterns, you've got smooth ER, it says it's either protein or carbohydrate hydrate biosynthesis. Rough ER says things like lipid and protein and carbohydrate biosynthesis. So we got three types of biosyntheses going on and we're, we're trying to mix and match uh, the correct combination. So, mm, okay, so uh, smooth ER is smooth and rough ER is rough because of how it looks like when you're looking at, at the organelle under a microscope. So go ahead and tell me, what makes rough ER rough? And then that'll help us understand what's, what's smooth ER. <clears throat> what do you think? What makes rough ER rough? What gives it that bumpy, bumpy appearance when you're looking at rough ER under a microscope. It's a certain kind of protein, very important for the biosynthesis of this one big macromolecule that is so important to our bodies. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that, Flora. Yeah, we'll talk about what smooth ER does then. I feel like a lot of you do know this and um, you uh, all answered so quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it's ribosomes, you got it. Ribosomes are the key component for translation. So the, the, the biosynthesis of proteins. So if you are like, I know that part, rough ER is protein biosynthesis. Y'all, like, look at that. There's only one answer choice that gives you that. All you had to do was know that rough ER was protein biosynthesis. 
And then it didn't really matter what was going on with smoothie R, right? There's only one answer choice that had that. That's the pattern of, that's the power of, 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 you know, leveraging the knowledge that you do now. So real quick, smoothie R um, is involved in lipid biosynthesis as well as carbohydrate biosynthesis. Yeah. Um, and uh, so lipid biosynthesis is things like plasma membrane things, a lot of the cholesterol, um, steroid hormones are also kind of synthesized there. Um, a lot of carbohydrate metabolism exists on the smoothie R. So smoothie R is like, you know, all the other macromolecule kind of stuff and then protein biosynthesis specifically for those uh, ribosomes on the raw ER. Now, <coughs> I'm gonna ask a related question and I apologize, I'm just wondering it over. Anyone in the room, uh, future doctors, anyone who is taking AP bio because you're like, I want to go to college and I'm gonna be a pre-med and I'm going to, um, you know, that's, that's what I wanna do for my career. Is you're interested in going to medical school to becoming a physician in the very near future. Because I'm gonna tell you something kind of cool about what you're doing right now with this test. And I hopefully it will help you um, give some context for not just the immediate, like the AP bio exam, but give you some context for the future. <clears throat> so Kaylin, biosynthesis just means to create a biological molecule. Molly, you are, you know this question? Flora, you too? Yeah. Marie Gayu, I feel like those are all very relevant and related processes. This is, uh, this is not from the AP bio resources. I took this, <laughs> I took this question from uh, an MCAT practice test. So MCAT is a medical college admission test. And, uh, and I want you to recognize something really important is the stuff that you are learning for AP bio is directly related to the stuff that you have to study for going on to, um, and, and, and you know, doing the standardized test for med school. <clears throat> so I want you to think about the long-term stuff that you're studying right now, because it's not something that you just want to like cram in your head for the short term and run away. But you know, this is, this is relevant um, and it is something you will need to continue to know for the future. So I don't want you to cram for the short term. I want you to try to understand the reason why the stuff that you are memorizing and well, and you know, future you will, will certainly help yourself, okay? So you, they will thank you, okay? So that is it for today. Um, I had a lot of fun with you all. I do hope that um, you know, we get to meet again next week, come back on Monday at 3 p.m. We're gonna do some more AP Bio moving into unit three. Um, and you know, as the information comes along to us, we will definitely continue to share it with you um, and tell your friends to come. I had lots of fun um, and, and, and thanks as well to Nick. I hope to see you all back here on, on Monday.